Formula E is known to be one of the hardest series in motorsport to race in. Success comes down to a huge number of varying factors and of course, teamwork. Now back in season nine, the introduction of the Gen 3 car officially changed the game. The racing was revolutionized, it became more competitive, more action packed, more dramatic. But one of the overwhelming differences that completely changed the face of Formula E racing, strategy. Now we talk about attack mode and energy management strategy, often throwing words and phrases like slipstream and peloton racing out there, but what does that all mean? What does strategy in Formula E look like and how has it changed? Time to dive in and find out. Let's set the scene of why strategy plays such a significant role. Outside of the powertrain and a small number of internal components, Formula E is essentially a spec series. The teams are limited in what they can change or customise in their cars. The structural and fundamental elements of the car, the chassis, the battery, tyres and so on, are completely identical. So there's no chance for teams to outspend others on the power source or aerodynamics. Now this makes things more competitive and unpredictable during the races, making the setup and strategy at each race crucial to success. A large feature of that strategy is the optimization of the usable energy available. The drivers have an FIA preset amount of energy to complete the race in, alongside the number of laps. Now this is roughly 60% of the energy needed to complete the laps flat out. But racing flat out for the whole race would not get you across the line at the end. Energy strategy during the race in its most simple form, you take the number of laps in a race against the amount of usable energy available dictated by the FIA and you build a target based on the efficiency of your powertrain, which allows drivers to use as much energy as possible per lap without running the risk of going over the limit and not being able to finish the race. Teams have a choice, how much energy do they use on each lap? And that we call the energy target or the lap target. So on the simplest way, you could just take your amount of energy and split it by the number of laps, divide by the number of laps you've got in the race. And we call that ISO energy target. Basically the same amount for each lap using the battery in its entirety, split the nicest way we can. However, it doesn't normally work like that. I might want to overtake another car. And to do that, I might use a bit more energy than the ISO amount. And therefore I have a little bit less to use for the rest of the race or I might want to save a bit more energy to use when I'm under attack. And in that case, those chunks of energy that I use for each of those laps are a bit more, and again, I've got to use a bit less the rest of the race. So maybe I budget for my attack, so I'll use a bit less early on to be able to attack at that point. So there's lots of different strategies that you can do as teams, and how you choose to do that, there's normally some decision making up front, but also it changes live in the race. So somebody overtakes me and I don't want them in front of me, I need to overtake them back. I'll use a bit more energy for the next two laps, either to catch them up again or to overtake them. Suddenly that plan that I had before the race is all different. So the teams have to communicate with their drivers, they have to help them negotiate the race, what the other cars are doing around them, and also the best plan to get the car to the end of the race. But on top of that, so the drivers have got some impact, impact some input, choosing how much energy to use, but also the car is re-optimizing. Every time that the driver does something, it tries to get the car home in the most efficient way it can. So you've got a system on the car doing its thing, and as a, as a strategy, as a team approach, driver and team on the outside, you've got to choose how you use your energy to. The overall aim, cross this finish line with as close to 0.00% of usable energy remaining, having left nothing on the table. But here is where the problem lies. There are 22 drivers and 11 teams all trying to do the same thing. So to get a competitive edge, the strategies have to differ. The strategy starts long before anybody travels to a racetrack. Back at base in the simulator, where the formation of an energy management strategy can begin to be worked out. The simulator prep is complete, the teams head to the racetrack and then start to compare the sim data to that of real world running in free practice. And then it's about starting the race in the best possible position in qualifying before the strategy games begin for the race. So just imagine, you put it on pole position. How do you make sure you finish in the same spot? And why is that so challenging? Why is that so rare in Gen 3 Formula E? Time to enter the world of Sipstream and the now infamous 
peloton style of racing. At some Formula E races where the layout of the track means that it's over a high power average and, and basically high speed race tracks, leading a Formula E race tends to not be a really good idea uh, because of this drag that we have in this, in this uh, Gen 3 Formula E cars. So if you're the car leading, you are basically using more energy per lap than all the cars following you, similar to what you see in cycling. So therefore it creates this strategy in Formula E where actually in that type of races, no one really wants to lead, you want to be in the pack somewhere, you know, P3, P4 or behind that to save energy uh, during, during a number of laps in a race and then you can then use that energy save to deploy it at the end of the race and then win the race that way. So it creates this really unconventional peloton style racing in motorsports that we've never really seen before. On track, it's all about picking moments. When to use attack mode, when to overtake, when to launch and switch from efficiency racing to flat out racing. All decisions that influence the strategies required to get as many points on the board as possible. Two very different examples of effective strategy and tactics we've seen work well so far this season can be seen with the likes of Nick Cassidy and Oliver Rowland. On one hand, there's execution like Cassidy's, intelligent strategy that sees both the ability to climb up the order if needed and maintain position if he's qualified higher up. Both managing the risk of when to overtake and using that energy to make multiple positions in one go, whilst being smart and keeping away from contact and out of trouble, avoiding potentially race-ending damage. And on the other hand, there's the more elbows out, aggressive approach being adopted by more and more drivers, but perfected by the likes of Oliver Rowland. A strategy that sees him make up the positions needed earlier in the race, consuming more energy to do so, but then battling hard to hold that position whilst conserving enough energy for the best possible race result. Formula E is a very tricky beast. And despite all of the simulation and preparation work that goes in before a race weekend, Races very rarely pan out in the way that teams expect. A lot of things can change. Crashes, stoppages in the race, yellow flags, red flags, safety cars, weather. All of those things mean that strategy engineers need to be on hand, either here in rooms like this on site or back at base, to constantly tweak the strategy at any given moment based on what's happening on track. So in the race, strategies can, can be impacted by lots of different things. Let's say there's a full course shadow or a safety car. In effect, that changes the amount of energy you've got remaining compared to the amount of laps you like to use it for. So if, for example, I have a three lap safety car, I'll be slower for an amount of time using a less amount of energy each, each of those slow laps than I would in a normal race. It means my, my, my kind of strategy going for the rest of the race has to update and be changed. Equally as much as I'm racing other cars, I can consume more energy when I didn't expect to or didn't want to, just fighting the other cars, and now I've got to take account of that for the rest of the race. So as you go into the race, you can have a really good plan, but things change. Full course yellow, safety car, cars racing me really hard, having to get back into position, be prepared to take my time, save some energy and use it later. All these things, they change as you see the race unfold in front of you. Energy management, as we know, is a huge part of strategy in Formula E, but equally as important is attack mode strategy. So attack mode in Formula E is a strategic element we have in a race, uh, where the cars uh, have to go off, off, uh, off the racing line, basically, uh, trigger the attack mode, which then gives extra power. So you lose some time going into a suboptimal line, but then once you've done that, you get extra power for a number of minutes. So it becomes a really good strategic element in the race because, especially in the peloton races, when you don't necessarily want to lead the race, it can be useful sometimes to drop back a few places, get some extra power, and then to use it to overtake again. So depending on when you are in the pack, whether you are at the front or in the middle or at the back of the pack, it has a different strategic element. Uh, but ultimately, it's kind of having, having this balance of not losing places at all if possible, whilst taking attack mode and then using the extra power to make some places and, and move forward.